sometimes we're involved in family treatment programs where they're giving us information, kind of guiding us, and we go to Al-Anon, and that's amazing support, and this is yet another, this is one of the more amazing support groups that I've encountered. But sometimes there are pieces that kind of get left off. So I wanna just talk about some basic definitions so we can kind of pull it all together. Tolerance means, anybody? Requiring more to get the same effect, right? And so if we take something every day, right? Um, a strawberry, because it makes us feel happy. Well, in a few days, maybe we need two strawberries to make us feel happy, because we're kind of bored with that one strawberry, right? So when we talk about substances, we need to take more to get the same effect, right? So that's a tolerance. And now folks using substances typically build on their tolerance. They require more and more and more and more just to get the same effect. So what Mark mentioned, I think it's important, we talk about detox. Detox are two things. It's either medically monitored or medically managed, right? And it's only to treat your physical symptoms. And many detoxes, I know detoxes I'm involved with currently and in the past, we provide an introduction to everything. We give you individual counseling and group counseling and introduce you to 12 step and we kind of throw all this stuff at you. Has anyone here had the flu? Anyone? Like down on your back flu? Almost hospital flu. Okay. So that's how you're feeling and we're throwing all the stuff at you. That's pretty much what detox is. And we leave and you're done. So we really didn't give you anything. And how much did you retain? I know I'm cranky and miserable. If I'm sick, oh boy. There are, I can't say them here, but you know, really bad words coming out, right? And right, and so that's what's happening. And so our our Loved ones, they're going through withdrawal. So withdrawal are the toxins leaving and your body physically needing more. And so that's what it feels like, having that flu really bad down on your back. So how much information are folks retaining or processing? And we're talking and they're saying, sure. And I think genuinely they, want, they don't want that. They want to be okay. They want to feel better, right? But how much is happening? So we talk about detox as the first step. But it's not treatment. Because there's not a lot happening, processing. There's so many areas affected by substance use. So that's only the first step. And you're not even completely detoxed. We have something called post-acute withdrawal symptoms. So there are some of those symptoms that can last months long. So we talk about different levels of care. We talk about residential treatment. We talk about sober living. We talk about partial care where you can reside home or in a sober living and go five, six days a week for a few hours. I just want you folks to know, be educated on different areas of treatment. What, what are folks doing at night? Are they being monitored in their sober living houses? Like what is a continuum? What are they getting in their treatment? Ask questions. If you're faced with a decision where your loved one needs treatment, ask a lot of questions. You know, be involved. Not controlling. Because remember, who are we taking care of first? Because remember the oxygen mask. So if we give the oxygen mask to the baby first, then what happens? We think we saved somebody else's life because they're more important than us and we would do anything for them. Right? And as a parent, I can tell you, I would feel the same, I definitely feel the same way. But if I do that and I die, then we both die. Right? So I have to take care of me before I can take care of someone else. That's a super hard concept as a parent. Super hard. Right? You have one, one piece of chocolate, right? And your loved one says, can I have it? And you go, here, <laughs> not your chocolate? Good, then you know how to have fun, so show us how to play with some play -Doh. So 
we talk about asking questions and staying involved, and we learn different things like setting limits and boundaries, and we hear this other thing called tough love. I'm not really sure what tough love means. I think we need to be loving and supportive, but I think it's very important for us to set limits and boundaries. I have somebody in detox right now. Um, you know, someone called, hey, can you help me out? And Mark gave you guys good references, and you know, as professionals, we're networking, we're, we're saying what's available, we're all kind of connected and helping you get your folks where they need to be. We need to set <coughs> limits and boundaries. I have somebody in detox now, and it was a struggle. It took four days working really with the dad and him, getting him into treatment, and you know, I'm talking to him, and He's like, I don't really want to do it. And I said, you know, you seem kind of, I can't say bad words here. I mean, you seem kind of not right. He's like, really? What makes you think that? Really? I, gee, I don't know. So we're talking to him. We're working with him. We're working with dad. We finally get him to detox. And now, so I call over. Okay, let's transfer him to the next level of care. Don't let him go home. From one right to the other, let's go residential, and then we'll talk about another level of care, we'll take it a step at a time. And he says, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't really wanna go, I feel better. I, I'm not sick anymore, I feel better, I know what I have to do, I feel better, I, I'm gonna come home. So the treatment agency calls me and says, he wants to go home, we can't make him go. And I said, oh really, get the dad on the phone. Dad's weak in the knees. So I have dad's on the phone with me, he's on the phone with him. And so I'm yelling at the dad. You be firm. You don't even have to mean it. I know you're crying inside. You can be sad and hurt and cry on the inside. Be firm in your tone and tell him you love him, but he needs to do this. And he did, and he hung up and he agreed to go to the next level of care. So we're taking it a step at a time. And then the dad fell apart to me, and that's okay. Because you can fall apart. You don't have to keep it all together all the time. And I think this is one of the venues you can fall apart. But you have to set limits and boundaries. No means no. And what are those al sayings, right? Say what you mean and mean what you say. And if you can't set that limit, then don't. But set what you can and take steps to set what you can. What you say goes. You have a vote, right? They're lives. Any questions so far? No? When is the last time anyone in here took a bubble bath? Wow. That's everyone's homework tonight? Take care of you. Take care of yourself. And that's part of setting limits and boundaries, is taking care of you. And that doesn't mean to avoid them. It doesn't mean throw them out of the house. I can't tell anybody to make that decision. I can tell you, you have house rules, right? Or you have limits and boundaries. Maybe you can't you know, be near the kids when you're under the influence. Maybe you can't come over if you're in that condition. I'm not going to give you money, I'll give you food. Maybe I'll put gas in your car, but I'm not going to give you money. You can set limits and boundaries, but we love that person inside, and they're still there. We're waiting for them to come out. So it's important for us to kind of be firm. Holidays, really tough time. Detox is packed, really, and thank goodness, right? Because who wants them home around the holidays, and now we're going to have a nice holiday dinner, even though we miss them, and that's our biggest gift yet. I can't tell you how many parents cry can we come get them? It's Christmas after all. It might be the last Christmas that Aunt Fanny's gonna see them. I'm going to pick them up. Are you kidding? You're not even going to finish the detox process. So what happens during the detox process, we give medication to treat symptoms, to treat the flu symptoms. Now, the folks that raise your hands that you've had the flu, do you take medicine? Maybe? Theraflu, right, Tamiflu, right, Tylenol, Motrin. Did it help? Helped a little. Did you feel like, you know, like a rock star? No, not really. 
So similar stuff happens in detox. We're treating symptoms with medication, but you're still feeling like you have the flu. Now what happens is, remember we talked about tolerance, right? We're taking more to get the same effect. So we start with one, then we need two, then we need three, then we need four or 50 or 100, or depending on the substance, we take large quantities to get that same effect. So now, we're not taking them anymore. So now, it starts to go back down. So it's very dangerous to leave. It's the most dangerous to leave at that particular stage because, you know, well, it took me, you know, maybe I was snorting heroin and it took me 10 bags of heroin not to get high, not to feel good, just to not be sick. So when I leave detox and I use that same 10 bags, because that was only just to not get sick, well, it's like I'm using that 10 bags for the first time because my tolerance has changed. So I haven't had it in a few days. Does that make sense to folks? So when your loved ones are in detox, it's the most critical stage for them to complete. You know, there's a medical team that are monitoring them to avoid that from happening. Any questions about that? No? The next stage, it's important to, at the, if possible, to have a direct transfer to the next level of care. Some places provide detox and then residential in the same facility. Some do not, you know? And so you have to really um, be aware. If you're going to the next level of care, then it's a direct transfer. I know in detoxes that I worked in, um, a few different in the past, three different in the past, and one I'm working on now, uh, we do direct transport. You know, I set that up in all the facilities. You don't need to go home because you need your blow dryer. You know, I'm sure you haven't had your blow dryer in a few days. You, have, you know, all facilities will have the washer and dryer. You can wash your clothes. Somebody can drop off your things. You don't really require, we'll give you a toothbrush, you know, all those things, you're good. We'll even give you fun stuff. Who needs a fun thing? You do? Have some Play-Doh. <laughs> we all need fun stuff. We need to be okay. They need to be okay. But we need to achieve that balance. But it's important to encourage them, right? But it's important to set limits. We're not picking them up. You know, no, they can't stay. I know they, I heard the same thing 50 times already before. I know what to do. This is boring. I, I've been through treatment so many times I could be a counselor. I go, wow, is that all it took? Have you paid my student loans? <laughs> Just saying. It's a little bit more involved than that, you know. And if you're hearing the same thing, maybe you need to hear it different. Or maybe you need to try something different. Or maybe it's not a long enough term. So the best product that we can have, the best end result that we're looking at in healing is the longest term possible. Look at all the life areas that are affected. I'm talking about detox, so I'm talking about physical symptoms and physical reactions. But what about everything else that's been affected? What about your relationships with yourself primarily, right? The relationships with you guys. What about jobs? What about um, finances? What about other medical, you know, the dentist? What about, there's so many areas. What about just feeling good about who you are and not looking for someone else's approval? Do you know why folks use substances? Anybody? Feel bad. I did hear your answer, but I gave you a prize. Yeah. To feel better. As opposed to what? Feeling. Feeling bad. Feeling bad. Something feels bad. It's internal or it's physical. But something feels bad. It feels so bad that I don't want to feel anything. But there's something feeling bad. 
It's so bad that it's unmanageable. So I use a substance to feel better. Real simple terms. Now we also talk about a genetic predisposition. Let's just throw that in just for fun. Folks here, this is a disease, the disease concept. I wanna talk a little bit about that because I hope to explain it in the way that everyone leaves here and says, you know what, if, if I just listen to her talk and give out Plato, good, but really I got this. So we hear these analogies. Anyone wanna tell me what their analogy is? Any rock star in here? What do we say? It's a disease because it's like diabetes. Has anyone heard that? Right? It's like diabetes, right? And everybody goes, yeah, yeah, yes. Well, not really. I don't get it. I don't get the connection. Anybody here get that connection? Anyone? You get it? That it's like diabetes. here's the non. So we both have our first, what's the first experimental thing? Anybody in here? We won't tell. What happens in here stays in here. We're in church. Alcohol. Alcohol. What did you have? A quart of vodka. A quart? Wow. You go, girl. Yeah. So you had a quart of vodka. Wow. Okay. Who, so who had a beer? A beer. A beer. A can? Yeah. Anybody else? Oh, a nip. Oh, God. Or not a nip. Boone's Farm wine. Is it like Strawberry Hill or something? It's like a dollar. There you go, right? Okay, so let's go with the Boone's Farm. I think everybody chuckled at that. So you have this Boone's Farm, right? And so here you are. So here's the genetic predisposition, and I don't have the gene. We both have the same amount. This person says, oh my gosh, this is the most amazing thing that I've ever experienced in my entire life. And this person goes, yeah, it was okay, it was nasty, it tasted disgusting, I threw up, and yeah, maybe I'm not gonna do it again, or you know, maybe I will, I don't know. See the difference? So when we add more, right? Because we talk about, nobody starts, nobody, like the commercial, nobody grows up to say, gee, I wanna be an addict. That's what I wanna do. It doesn't work out, it doesn't really happen. There's something physical different that happens. I am relating it back to the disease. Thank you for being patient with my ADHD. So, disease. What makes something a disease? So you go to the doctor, right? My doctor is, right out in front of me. I tell him, I have a sore throat, my ear hurts, this hurts, I have all these complaints. He looks up all the symptoms in a book and he goes, ah, here's what you have. This is your diagnosis, you have pharyngitis. I'm like, okay, cool, it's a sore throat. And, and he has the magic formula because then he says, okay, and you're gonna take this and this and this antibiotic and that's your prescription, right? Does that not happen? You're laughing, right? Your doctor has it out too? Right in front of me. So we have the same thing in substance use, okay? Substance use disorder. We have a DSM. We have a diagnostic, right? Statistical manual, DSM. So we have all these symptoms. So what makes something a disease are a few components. Anyone know what they are? Because I have prizes. What 
makes anything a disease? Okay. So what makes something a disease is it's chronic, like diabetes. It's never going to go away. I have it. It can be arrested. It can be in remission. I can take care of it. But it's not ever going to go away. It's not something that will ever leave my system. It's not something that I'm going to grow out of. Does that make sense? So a disease. We talk about addiction. We talk about any disease. It's chronic. Right? What else? Anybody? They're going to need treatment. Well. need to go buy some shoes. Because <laughs> you're ahead of what we're talking. You're walking ahead. Hold on to that thought. It's chronic. It's progressive. What is progressive? Without treatment, it will get worse, right? Like anything. Let's compare it to diabetes. We don't treat it and we eat the strawberry shortcake, it's going to get worse. Maybe I only need to watch my diet. Maybe then I needed to take medication. Maybe now as a result of that, I need insulin. Without treatment, it will get worse. Substance use disorder, without treatment, it will get worse. Right? It's not going to stop on its own. The next thing. It's fatal. Ultimately, without treatment and a continued progression, it will be fatal. That's what makes something a disease. And the very last thing, which is the most important, which is I think it's left out a lot, what makes this a disease is that it is primary. And here's what that means. The symptoms, right? I described the doctor, pharyngitis, I have these symptoms. The list of symptoms are unre, all of these, if you have all these symptoms, they're unrelated to anything else. Right? I have pharyngitis because I have all of the symptoms describing it. Substance use disorder. What do you think those symptoms are? Depression. No, but that was a good guess. You definitely look like you're going to use that Play-Doh later. <laughs> I can tell on your face. <laughs> you're like, I'm going to make something with that. Thoughts, urges, and cravings. Remember we talked about the genetic predisposition and the folks that don't. Thoughts, urges, and cravings. Obsessive thoughts. Now, independently, sometimes we have obsessive thoughts. Sometimes I have obsessive thoughts about buying shoes, right? Just putting it out there, right? I mean, I get a little shoe sticky, shoe, it happened. Anybody have a shoe obsession? There's a couple people. Cheeseburgers? Is this che cheeseburger? I don't like cheeseburgers. Okay, there you go. <laughs> cheeseburger, right? Is five guys the way? Yeah. Okay, right. See, this is what I'm talking about. Okay, see? You will get some five guys. Physical craving? 
Tell me about it. Indulge in that 
some tattoos, some reminders, some fun things to remember that you're important. We're loving, supporting, setting limits and boundaries, okay? There's a balance. There's something that separates me from you. And so we'll go, you can hang on to them if you want because I may be giving more up. So we want to take a look at what is our ultimate goal here? We're saying here's our loved one who is dependent, right? They're dependent on substances. And we are, we heard this word, codependent. Yeah? Anybody here codependent? Well, I definitely am a professional codependent. I get paid now to be one. Doesn't stop. Codependent. And so now what? Now we're enmeshed. Where do they end? Where do I end? Where do they begin? It's like we're one. I feel what they feel. They're miserable, now I'm miserable. They're happy that I could be happy today because they're in a good mood, right? What is our ultimate goal here? Because we're talking to them about treatment and we want them to be supported, right? And we want them to we want them to get better. Not us, we want them to get better. And so we want them to be independent. Yes, is this the goal? And what about for us? Then what will we do? Go help somebody else? Become workaholic, maybe? Guilty. Okay. We also need to achieve to become independent because we don't want to dependent, codependent people, opposites attract. We know that's not working or we all would not be here right now. So what we want, what our goal is, two independent people becoming interdependent, right? We join hands. We're not connected. We join. Two independent, maybe you like red and I like blue. Maybe you like the blue Play-Doh and I like purple Play-Doh and we join together because we both like Play-Doh. We can join together, but we are yet separate. And so we have to put the same work in ourselves that we expect them to do. And you guys have made an amazing accomplishment by coming here today to just do that, to gain support, right? And to get connected and to get more information. Anybody have any questions? None? Yeah. What would you recommend as a <laughs> Well, I'm going to first tell you that I think it may only take one time. I am not a believer that it requires many times. I don't like the phrase relapse is part of recovery, I think relapse can happen. And I think that we address it if it happens. But when we say relapse is part of recovery, I don't believe that. It, it's really not part of that process. We're talking about a healing growing process and a setback is not in that plan. Should it happen, we, we address it, we figure it out. But we shouldn't plan for that because I feel like it's giving permission for that to happen. So I wanna back up by saying, folks that enter treatment one time, it can work. Okay, so it can work. I think we need to look at, and I can't give you a, a magic number, because I gave out my wands, my magic wands, but there's not a magic number, but I can tell you it requires a length of time that all life areas are completely put together. So for each person, that's gonna be different. And we're not gonna fudge, well, that one's not really important, or that's not a big area. But we talk about all our life areas. One of the first things that happens when folks come into treatment is we do something called a biopsychosocial assessment, right? And we take, we ask questions, it's a couple of hours. We ask every life area. We ask physical, we ask medical, we ask your mental health status. So how do you feel from, you know, from as long as you can remember up until today, right? The whole, in, in every one of these areas, educational, vocational, uh, spiritual, what are your friendships like? What are folks doing for fun? What are your uh, home intimate relationships like? We ask all these questions. So all those things need to be stabilized 
When I say stabilize, not like, oh, well, we're talking now. You know, oh, things are great. We love each other again. You know, you love each other again because somebody's not using substances. But do you really have that full connection, complete trust, love each other? Because that's what I'm talking about. I'm like the, oh, well, I'm looking for a job and, you know, I got a part-time job at whatever. No, this is my career goal, love job that I wanted. Or I am enrolled in school. Like, are you really put together in all life areas? That is what it takes. And I think that we don't give it enough time. And I realize the challenges and the barriers because there are a lot. There's not enough treatment agencies available. There's not that availability. There's disruption. There's not, there's cost involved. I, I realize there's a lot of barriers, but really we're, we're looking, at, looking at all of that. And at what point are we giving up? You know, what is our social life like? You know, are we integrated with a sober network? Like this is a network. Folks need a network. You need multiple people, because maybe somebody doesn't pick up the phone, maybe 20 people don't pick up the phone. And I think a very key, key important thing that many people miss, what are you doing for fun? I've worked in every modality of treatment from um, outpatient to residential to a methadone clinic to uh, partial care, uh, just everything, detox, every modality I've been involved in. What are folks doing for fun? So a big one in outpatient, I'm great, I got 90 days and we're having a party. Really, 90 days? Because I, I'm proud of you. Don't, I, and you're getting a sticker and I'm really proud and I'm super happy and I love it. What are quality things that are in your life and you have a long way to go? I, what you, you know, you're 27, what would you do on Friday? I went to a meeting, I had a great time. What would you do on Saturday? Yeah, I went to a meeting. Good, you should go to meetings every day. What else did you do? Well, I stayed home with my parents and I go, really, because you're 27, you must be bored to crap. What are you doing for fun? Oh, well, not, you know, I had a good time with that. Really? And I'm not pushing her to go out. Right, and I'm pretty sure, I think you're lovely. I'd love to hang out with you, but if I were 24, I'm, I'm not offending you. I'm pretty sure I don't, right, we're not hanging out, right? So is it realistic, she's 24? So is it realistic for that? Is that realistic? No. For the rest of her life, and maybe it works now. I'm not touching that. And I think it's important to, when I say become integrated into a sober support network, I don't mean just go to the meeting, go to the diner and go home and you see everybody the next day. If you're fully integrated socially, those are, you, you make new friends. Right. And now you're going out with friends that have no interest, right? And your, your, your new network has no interest in old behaviors. Your new network has interest in new fun behaviors. Okay, thank you. Right, so realistic, 24, and then, the, and then we get this concept, right? We hear one day at a time, and then what, what do we hear? For the rest of my life, I have to do this, and then I become overwhelmed, and then I don't wanna do anything. Right, but what am I doing today for fun? Wow, you know what? So I met this girl last week and she's like, you know what? Let's go to Bloomingdale's and the makeup counter and they're gonna put makeup on us today because that sounded like fun to me. So that's what we did. But you're doing something social. You're doing something fun. You went bowling. I don't know, but you become fully integrated into that. It's not realistic to think that that's not going to happen. I. I I can never drink again, so I'm never going to a wedding again. Well, that's not realistic. Some point in your life, you may go to a wedding. Maybe you don't want to go now. I'm not suggesting that. 
But when you become fully acclimated, so when we say, to answer your question, what is an appropriate length of time? I don't have the magic number, but we want a long enough time where the risk is so significantly less because all of my areas are so full and I feel good about myself. And so every day I now make a choice that I don't want to behave like that. I don't want to live that kind of life. And I'm not willing to even try to use a substance one time, right? Because I, you hear this, I, I tried to, because I thought I could just use it one time and then I could control it this time because, right? Well, if we're, we, that ship sailed, that, that already happened, you know? It's not an option. You're in this place because it's not a possibility. So, you know, what, what are we doing to make it so full that the thought of that just doesn't happen? It just doesn't. My life is so full and I have so much joy and I feel so good about myself, it's not an option. And I don't even entertain it as one. Anybody here quit smoking? Raise your hand high. Heavy smoker? Heavy smoking? Smoke day out, how many, pack a day maybe? Do you think you can have one? Good. Right? It doesn't interest you anymore. That's a, that is a substance use disorder, it's nicotine addiction. And that's a great example, because we're talking about not just the nicotine, because you could take a patch of lozenger. That's not what it's about. It's about associating it, I smoked when I had coffee, I smoked after a meal, I like the oral fixation, right? There's a whole bunch of other stuff going around, it's not just the nicotine, right? So when we talk about Folk, we talk about opiate because that is like the biggest discussion, right? So we remove the opiate and detox. Is it really only about that? Nope. It's about all the other stuff in addition to. Does that make sense to folks? Any more questions? Yes, Thank you, you very much.